It's my pleasure to welcome game designer Max Piers. So thank you all very much for coming to my talk. It's an absolute pleasure. And this here is called Converse, Conversation with the Players, Spatial Composition. Now, I've got my clicker here. I thought someone was clicking for me. In this talk, we'll be going through a few things. And I really want you to take away a couple of elements. First, we'll be talking a bit about myself. The reason we're going to talk about myself is not because I like to talk about myself, but I want to show you my kind of point of view when I'm talking about spatial composition, showing and talking about how I view it. Some of the disciplines, some of the mediums will view it slightly different to how I do. Next, we'll be talking about composition, techniques used in different mediums, in how we create great photos, pictures, all of that. It's then finally, the meat of the talk, which is spatial composition and layout composition. So let's talk a bit about me and who I am. So I've been in the industry now for almost a decade, worked on a range of different titles, from that of mobile, indie, augmented reality, and now currently AAA. I'm an author of the book series called Let's Design, as well as the host of a podcast called Level Design Lobby. I've had the absolute pleasure and fortune to work with some incredible people throughout my time on some crazy, big, incredible projects, which I'm very happy about. And my role in the industry is that of a level designer. Now, some of you might know what level design is, others might not. So I'm going to be talking a bit about what it is that we do as level designers. We are the architects of the virtual world. We construct the playable spaces. This can take different forms from the grand bombastic places that we explore in, say, Fortnite, versus the more pig-run towers of that of Angry Birds. All of that is on us to make sure the player interacts with those spaces. Not only do we build these spaces, we actually control the flow, the pacing of these levels, making sure that we script when the player encounters certain challenges, enemy encounters, as well as when the player gets to relax and take in where they are. Now, each studio will have a slightly different pipeline, but the kind of overall pipeline we'll be talking about is the first stage of pre-production. The most important thing when you're creating a level, firstly, is to gather all the information that you can, right? Whether this is the emotional theme we want the player to feel, whether this is where the location is taking part, who are you actually working with? All of this will help you actually create incredible spaces. Once we know all of this, we'll have our first kickoff meeting with all of these incredible people to find out what it is that we want to execute, what it is we have for our own visions for when building these spaces making sure we then gather all the references we can, create our level design document to share with the team to have a more unified vision, as well as then creating the 2D map or the first block out. Once we have that, we'll then move on to the actual production phase. In this one, we'll actually start to create and do the more fun side of level design, which is blocking out those spaces. Here we'll go through, block out, and then start to iterate on these layouts, as well as then adding in the gameplay elements making sure to test them, does it feel right, check the pacing, all of this. Once we have finally started to actually build it out and make it feel, again, more playable, more enjoyable, we'll enter the final phase before closing, which is iteration. Iteration means that we're constantly playing through this. Because once we finish blocking out, we'll hand it over to Art, who will make our ugly gray box into something beautiful that encourages people to explore. But it's important to make sure that the gameplay still works even after the art passes, make sure that people know where they're going through that of the lighting pass. As I said, it's important that we constantly play through and iterate. Now, the topic of spatial composition takes place normally around that and the production phase of this. So now you know roughly where you'll be implementing this if you take away from this talk and move forward. So now let's talk about well, what is composition itself. Composition is a technique that helps improve that of a scene by arranging the elements, whether that be some sort of rocks, enemies. We arrange them in a way that becomes pleasing to the eye and creates an overall better and enjoyable experience. Now, composition can work and take place in many different types of shots, movies, and all of this. The first one here, we have this great picture taking in this of like a, an ice cavern looking on and framing this of the sunset and the person walking past. We can also include this in our action scenes as well, where we have these fast-paced lines with our 
with our character over-exaggerating when they're about to throw the punch. Or we can center off a product that we want to sell and say, hey, how cool is this watch? It's in lava, pretty badass. But there's a lot that goes in to composing a great shot. There's many different elements. You have the rules of third, the rules of space, symmetry, frames, leading lines, and many more. The rule of thirds, for those of you who don't know, is like this diagram over here. By intersecting this shot into nine spaces, we're advised that you should have your point of interest intersecting with two of these grid crossover points, again, creating something that's a lot more pleasing when looking at it. Now, let's talk about the rules of space. Over here in the west, we believe, or should I say, we read from left to right. And then when we're constantly seeing adverts like for this car, for example, it makes us see that as it moves forward, if we were to purchase this car, then we're moving forward with our lives, that we're advancing with it. So when we're trying to compose an image showing that we're progressing and helping selling, this is a way that we can do it. However, we can do it in other ways as well. There's a great show called Insecure. And what I love about the cinematography here is we constantly have it where the camera has so much space behind her head and what it's doing is it's showing, oh, she's constantly lingering, for those of you who've seen the show, she's constantly lingering on her choices, the past, past relationships, past mistakes. So when we have this, we're kind of selling this to the viewer as well. So where you place and where you have your empty space can really tell a lot about either that of the product or the person's mindset throughout it. Now, symmetry is a beautiful thing that we can add, right? It makes it easy to read. We can have it along the vertical, the horizontal line, all of that, and make it feel very, you know, look at that. They're very pretty. You know, you can go, oh, guys. That was really bad, really bad. It's only streamed, guys. Thank you, thank you. But again, when we see this, we're able to take in all of this information very quickly. Not only is it pleasing and makes us go, oh, it allows us to actually see all of that information very quickly and be very pleased with it. Now, another thing that we can actually do is that of frames. We showed this a little bit earlier, but what we had here is there's two great examples. The first one here on the left, where we're actually using that of a cavern entrance to create a frame focusing us on that ice pillar here and the sun just hitting it just right. But we can use this from a narrative perspective as well. In the film Mood for Love, we find out that these two characters, well, their spouses are actually having an affair. And with the fact that the film is set over in Hong Kong, what they try to do is they try to sell that these two are constantly being watched with the fact that Hong Kong is constantly overcrowded and very small spaces. We can even see here that those two are in a room. If you want to share more of a space, the cinematographer and director probably could have just moved into that room. But because we're creating the illusion that we shouldn't be there as the viewer, that we are almost spying on them, making them feel more uncomfortable. Now, leading lines is probably the most, if you follow anything about level design on Twitter, is the most tweeted about <laughs> technique there is ever. But it is actually a very powerful tool. It is best when combined with other things, but it still can help us. This is a photo I took years ago back when I was at home. And we can see here, by using these branches, we're able to actually draw in the focus on the, my little character over here, helping us. So leading lines, although over-tweeted about, is definitely a great helpful tool for us. Angles is a really interesting one, especially when we compare that to our, what we do with level design. By having someone who's above us, shooting them from a low angle, it creates that contrast of power. Like even right now, if we look at how you're sat versus where I'm stood, I'm not a particularly tall person, but the fact that you're all looking up to me is showing a different power dynamic. Some of you at the back are slightly taller than me, so I just ignore what I say. But we're creating a bit of a power dynamic as you're watching me, and I'm supposed to be the one with the knowledge sharing it with you. And we can also have the opposite effect. When we're looking down from a high angle, we're actually able to make that of someone look weak in comparison, almost childlike. If you've ever seen the great film Spirited Away, you'll find that they start it by looking at the character very high. But as the character progresses, as she grows and comes into her own, the camera slowly moves up looking up at her, showing that she's found her own voice, that she has now got her own strength. Another technique we can use is that of positive and negative space. We can fill in the frame fully, like we have with this model over here, showing and focusing 
on that of the makeup that we're trying to sell versus the contrast of the light just drowning in that sea of yellow. Now, if you work clicker, some of you are wondering, well, this is all great, but what does this have to do with level design? Well, the great news is we can actually apply some of these techniques to what we do, but we have to think of it slightly different. Compared to films or that photography, we don't have the control when we finally release the game. The player has agency. Most games, they can turn the cameras when and wherever they want. So we have to be a bit more creative. First thing we can do with symmetry, right? It allows us to make memorable spaces, especially in the combat world. If we look at the top-down shot here of a map for Counter-Strike, you'll find that both starting points are basically the same. The reason for this is it allows for that of players when they cross over lines to instantly know how the spaces work with one another. But we can also use that in single player. From this map in Wolfenstein, the fact that it is very symmetrical allows us to read information quickly and not have to turn our heads or the camera to digest what's actually happening in this space. So we can use symmetry to give information, allow players to gain memory and understand things very quickly. Half-Life 2 is a great example of level design just full stop. If you haven't played it, do go check it out. It is very cheap on Steam right now. But they do a great job with framing. By having the characters look and be in that direction, we can also frame it with these bars here, showing in the scene where it is we as a player should be looking. And right of the way, we can instantly understand what's happening. Leading lines, again, can be used for us in different ways. We can use the environment itself to help guide the player. We can actually have that of gra actual graffiti arrows painted on the wall if it makes contextual sense. Or we can use that of, of pipes, wires, cones, all of that pointing in a direction. Now, angles is also a really interesting one when we're actually in games. Because although, as I said, the camera and player are normally one in video games, we can still reveal information in slightly different ways. If we're approaching a tower and we want the player to feel small and as if there's a giant challenge in front of them, we can introduce it to them on the lowest level, making them have to look up and in awe of this great tower. But if we want the player to feel that they're able to overcome this, then we can look down on it by having them on that same height and then maybe use some game mechanics to swing in through a window. Now, this is a great tweet by Tommy. If you don't, do go follow Tommy on Twitter. He's an incredible LD and now a teacher. I wanted to steal this, uh, this drawing because he does such a good job. But positive and negative space. If we fill the screen too much, then it actually detracts from the attention we want the players to go in. And if we remove the information, like at the top on the right, we're able to see the character bringing us forward here. So all of this, again, vital in creating what we're after with our own composition. Now, let's look at an example from that. Oh, uh, wow. So technical difficulties. The example is from a video, but it's no longer here. So let's pretend and go, wow, that was amazing. There we go. That's the enthusiasm. So I hear the audio for it, but I just don't see the video on here. Oh, that's great. Why is it not giving it for me? We've got to find a way across. There she is. That's our building. Hold on a second. I can't pause it. Anyway, the great example with that there, though, is that we've composed a brilliant shot in many different ways. Firstly, in how we move to get to that shot. By going up and around in the same direction over and over, we're slowly teasing it. We're slowly building up our angle. As you can see, the character stopped partway through and saw it, but slightly angled. Now, when we reached the top, were actually able to get more of a brilliant frame. They removed the skyline. They used that of unique shapes, all of that to draw us in to what our objective is. Now, as I mentioned earlier, composition is great. And when you're seeing it in different mediums, it's even better because the artist has full control. We don't have that. But by thinking slightly differently, we are able to use the agency to our advantage to help guide that of the player. So what's the takeaway from composition? It's a technique to improve a shot when we want to highlight a certain element or information. It draws focus on that important information, and it actually can be applied to level design in slightly different ways. So now let's get on to the actual meat of this topic, spatial composition and what it is. 
So spatial composition is a form of communicating with the player. It does this very much subconsciously, allows us to guide and show the player the vital information, where it is they need to go, and how to best approach the situation. By grouping elements which are similar together, it again makes the space a lot more readable and digestible. And it helps to build that of a mental map. The more that the player will see this, especially with the growth of open world games, the more that they'll be able to connect how the world is connected together. And as they move through the spaces, they'll be able to start to form their own map inside that head. Now, here's a couple of levels that I worked on within Cyberpunk. I worked on Ebeniki, where we go in to find that of Adam Smasher, as well as an underground club called Red Queen's Race. And we actually use this spatial composition within it. So no technical difficulties now. So here's a quick video walkthrough of this space. We find our way outside of the compound with Rogue as we make our way through to sneak past into the Maelstrom's hideout. see here the guards are actually guarding this small place to the entrance here. The player has different ways to get in, but they will start to assess which way is going to be the best way for them. Can you open it? Okay. Now one of the things I wanted to do when making this space is to make sure that the player actually started on a higher route so they could get a much better view and lay of the land by Same being way. higher, as Gotta we talked about earlier. Term having a higher angle to take in more information. Now this area here is a storage space. This is a nice, safe transition space for the player. By fencing it off and not having any enemies here, again, the player can pick up loot as well as assess which route they actually want to pursue. Another way to actually show a different kind of space that we're entering is through height. By having the stairs up here only just up by a meter, we can show that we're actually transitioning over into a different space. Eyes almost on me. Stay hidden. Another element of architecture we really wanted to grasp with this is to make sure that the Maelstrom didn't feel that they were living a life of luxury. By repurposing that of these containers and making their own living space, we're able to make it feel that this kind of strange world that they now occupy. Yeah, yeah, I swapped out what I could. Yeah, everything's working for now. Don't get yourself spotted. Finally, the player actually reaches their objective. Scan it, see if there's anything we can use. So I'm going to be talking about now how I actually applied that, thanks guys, of spatial composition to this one so that players were able to read the different choices that they had as well as what each space kind of represented. So through this already, we have that of a border. By having that 
of this border with the fence here, we're able to communicate that this, again, is a safe space. This here is a transition space for the player before they head off into the actual more dangerous zones. Another way that we can help to highlight this is through that of the height. We talked about this already, but if you look, the layout here, relatively flat except for different entrances through different routes. Even by raising up an area just by a meter or two can instantly cause separation between spaces. So we know that, again, we're transitioning into another space. Another thing that we wanted to show is what kind of buildings could the player enter and not enter so they wouldn't waste their time and get confused if they want to enter some containers versus others. So by having that of just simple things of windows and doors being highlighted, we're able to show which one should the player be able to go off and explore versus ones which players should go off and ignore. And then that finally of architecture as well. I talked about when we wanted the living spaces for that of the Maelstrom being more cramped and contained in repurposed containers. We're actually showing the priority of the Maelstrom in the narrative here as well. Because if you look, we have two buildings, one under the objective and the garage over on the left as well. They're having much bigger open spaces. They're also that of more diagonal as well, showing that they're actually prioritizing their work over their living spaces as well. Something that you may not get right away, but subconsciously is communicating with players how they actually value their own lives with how they work. And then this was each different area, residential, shipping, storage, and garage, all put together and spaced out differently so that we can understand how the spaces are put together in the overall level, but also divided in others. When you're creating that of spatial composition, you do have different tools available to you that you can use at different times. We have that of color. By having ones in slightly different color, you can either do that through lighting, the materials of the building. You're able to show the separation between spaces. Shapes as well. We talked about that of the containers being more square versus that of the garage and the drug kind of room more triangular and diagonal. We have different sizes as well. Typically, one cool tip that you can use is when you're wanting the player to discover the main path, you'll tend to use a double door. If you want the player to have like a flanking route, maybe some loot, you use that of a single door. Using size to establish, again, what is bigger priority as you make your way through our spaces. Architecture as well, different architecture styles. If you just look around in this room that we're in now, look at how the height changes already as well as that of stairs leading up, the stage itself, how it's all divided can help tell the story with the lower roofs down and the corridors almost pushing us out of the doors or in versus this of this open space we have above us, which is actually used to help draw us in to you know, watch little old ugly me. Then we have that of height as well. We've spoken about this by having who's taller, who's smaller, showing that of power dynamic and that of borders as well, whether that be fences, walls, all of that. Now this here is a great example by a former student of mine called Richard, who did an incredible job over on the CGMA course. And we have an entire task dedicated to understanding spatial composition. And this was also put together by Amelia Schatz, who did an incredible job. And this you can see here is his space, and he's done such a great thing by separating it, by adding that of in the factory, you have more of these blue, cold, gray colors, making it feel that the factory is very soulless. But also you'll notice that the factory is the highest peak of this level, showing again that people value more that of work than they do their own living spaces. But the living spaces are more brown and orange, having a bit more warmer tones of how people would actually communicate with that. But again, you can see on that picture on the bottom right that they're actually going down. So again, they value themselves lower and then we have the contrast of the mine itself versus the more open sky above us. We have the contrast of the mine keeping, adding a sort of like oppression as well as that of making it feel vastly different by playing around with roofs and height. Now, the reason that we do spatial composition, as I said, is all about guidance. We want to reduce confusion so players understand what each space is used for, how they use that space keeping the players in a constant state of flow so they know when to go, when to stop, and interact correctly, as well as communicating with the players where their objective is. Now, again, we might be asking ourselves, this is all cool as we divide the space, but how do we actually show what's important to the player? There's a term we can use called adding weight. 
Weight is a way for us to show this entrance is the most important to us. This building over here has the objective that we must get. We can do this in many different ways. We can make sure, like in the example of Last of Us, that these buildings have a much more unique contrasting shape to the others around them. That we use height raising them up, how to show when we frame certain parts so it's clear that this area is super important, as well as it could have multiple entrances compared to buildings that have none. So a summary about spatial composition is there's many tools available to use it. We're able to help the player understand what is vital, where the player needs to actually go, and also helps not only for guidance, but to sell the narrative, sell what this space's purpose is and how those who actually use the space before the player even arrives would use it. We now come out to layout composition. How do we use these kind of spaces in our layouts to, again, communicate with players? We've got many different ways that we can do this. A layout can take many different shape or forms as well, right? There's different games, different spaces, all using it in different ways. We can create different spaces by using different shapes to help us make a more meaningful connection. So if we imagine this apartment block and it would have this kind of, um, how do I say, communal garden, it keeps us focused on that of what's in this space here. By having just one entrance and one exit, we're able to make focus of what's going on here. These kind of elements would be absolutely perfect for, say, that of boss battles. And if we follow the green hour again, we keep the player constantly looping in towards these spaces. So if we want to have an area where we want the player to interact with that space, we focus centralizing the gameplay here. We have different other shapes, such as more circular and angular ones. If we imagine the spear, spear, spire in that at the top in the middle, we can start to sell the world built around it. The player have to climbing up different layers as they start to see that there are more stores down in the lower section. But as we get higher, we might be able to upgrade our abilities in weapons, armor, magic, before finally reaching that objective of the spire itself. And this here is, again, a great way to use for hubs so that players can constantly explore and go around. We could have that of ruins, different shapes scattered around. But if we have buildings or shapes that are looking very similar, we can instantly start to communicate, hey, there might be loot in these areas versus enemies as we go through. Or if we want the player to feel like they're getting lost while going through our cities, we can create more of a labyrinth kind of a way so players have many options ahead of them as they go through. Then we have symmetries. We talked about earlier, this is a great picture of Overwatch. If we want the player to spend more time in a certain area, we can make it feel vastly more unique versus the starting points of each enemy's base. And not only this, we can create a deeper meaning through all of these spaces. If you look at churches, particularly over in uh, the UK and that, one of the ways that we're trying to communicate that we're closer to God in the religion is by creating these cathedrals over which have that cross shape. And even if it's not this, you see a lot of spires almost trying to reach for the heavens, again, subconsciously showing that we are constantly trying to be closer in this purpose to God. But if we look at other architectural spaces, such as the Sydney Opera House, this is just out there on the sea, what they've done with the architecture is incredible because they want it to make it look like it's waves, as if though it is part of the sea, the ocean itself. So remember, when you are creating that of your spaces, to first of all, gather all the information. As we said, there's a lot of different spaces, a lot of different games, but think hard about what it is you actually want to, to, want to create. Because the more we know when we're creating, the better purposes, the better way that we can actually communicate with players subconsciously. So the thing is to take away on this final part is make sure, again, you gather all the information. What is the emotional theme you want? What is it we want the player to feel? Who are we working with? Because all these things make great levels. Different shapes encourage different types of movement. And certain shapes can contain a deeper meaning when we're thinking about these. So, Thank you all for listening to me. I hope that it's been fun. It's been fun for me. Kind of last takeaway, that spatial composition is a tool for guidance. It communicates with us primarily subconsciously, but don't, don't underestimate the power of subconscious communication. Mm -hmm.
player has agency, so we have to be creative when trying to guide them. And then adding weight to certain elements to help push and pull the players where you want them to go. And if you do want to learn more about this topic, there's some great talks out there. Peter Field has a great talk on YouTube, which is called Spatial Communication. We have that of Amelia Schatz, who, as I said, teaches the CGMA course, which is a great job over on that. Uh, this one is a great talk by Miriam, who is, I believe, the rock star architect. And she talks about how we use different shapes to communicate with cinematography as you go through the GTA worlds, as well as a great book, which is called How to Read Modern Buildings. So thank you all very much. If you do want to get in contact with us as well, I have mentorship programs where I can help improve your levels and portfolios. I have a book, so if you don't want to see my ugly face, but still like the information, you can read my book series here. And if you want to reach out to me, please feel free in all these different ways. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, do we have any questions uh, for Max on anything discussed today? Yeah. Um, could you would, would you mind just popping to the mic at the front? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. I've been enjoying uh, both talk and your podcast immensely. Um, uh, I'm Stan Janos. I teach uh, game design, and um, I was just wondering. Um, it was something that I noticed when I saw your um, your leading lines, uh, one of the slides where all the all the visual cues were to go right, mm. but on the left there was this dead end. Yeah. And I was thinking, as a player, I'd want to check out that dead dead yeah. end. And how do you balance that? They're like all your visual cues try mm. to steer the player in one direction, but there is this um, desire from the player to. Yeah explore and and just investigate the area and you know that if you go in this direction where the game designer wants me to go that will lead me to the next cutscene and I can't go back mm. and maybe there's a secret maybe there's a, some some coins or something yeah. that I really want this way and that could disrupt the flow, but how do you even deal with that? Because that's been mm. a, a big sort of challenge for me when I'm uh, uh, doing level yeah. design and instructing my students when it comes to level design. How do you work when, when, when the visual cues steer you in one direction, but the gameplay and the desire yeah. from the player to, is, is sort of working the opposite way? Yeah, it's a great question, mate. <clears throat> so, one of the things is we kind of don't fight the player you know, anymore. Like if they, we reward them for exploration, right? So we have elements where it's actually worth their time going through. Because players now are so much smarter because we've been playing games for so many years now, we want to almost go against the grain of what the designers want to do sometimes. And I think the, the best way to do it is by rewarding exploration and by including that. But by having different kind of shapes of, say, for example, if we turn to the left uh, in that example. By using something more of like a circular room, we can actually make it feel like the player is in a constant state of flow versus square, because they'll just come to a dead end 180. But if we use more of a circular approach, we can have them run around you know, the edges of the room, which just leads us back out the way we came. So by playing around with those different shapes as well, it can keep the flow and make it less of a harsh thing. But I, the biggest thing I'd say is, let them explore, reward them for those explorations because it's always important to let the player feel like they're in control versus just following what we say. So I hope that answers the question, mate. It does. Thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Any more? Uh, was there a question down here? Yeah. Um, I Hi, just have a question about um, the, um, how integrated are you in the design of uh, the rest of the game when you're talking about uh, the storytelling, uh, well, the characters and all? How integrated mm. do you ha need to have all the information in order to start making the, um, the spaces? Yeah. So we're, we're very much you know, integrated with everyone that we can be. Now, ideally, would you have all the information, but development's never that smooth. But you're constantly communicating with everyone, so you keep it in, 
keep everyone in mind. Like we constantly do reviews all the time where we'll call over our teammates, whether that be someone who's in mechanics design, narrative design, or maybe something about the characters as well. Like if we know that there's a writer solely focused on a character that maybe we're introducing into a level, we'll have them come over and let, let them tell us more about that character, right? Do they like a life of luxury? So we need to make sure that their house that we're exploring has all these great gold elements to them, or are they someone who's poor, and so we meet them under a bridge or something? So we're constantly in talk with them to help make sure that what we build matches that of the narrative and the characters there. So yeah, constant communication is the best way. But Sally, communication is sometimes, even if you're in a team of five to a team of a 1,000, communication can be the first thing that breaks down so constantly make sure that you're having your kickoff meetings, that you're keeping and emailing everyone as best you can for it. So I hope that answers the question, Champ. It does. Thank you. We have, uh, we have a question from the stream. Oh, OK. When designing for atmosphere, a certain level of visual polish like lighting and basic textures often feels necessary. How and uh, where and how do you draw the line between too much and too little visual definition in the block out stage? Yeah, it's a really good, good one to ask that because each <laughs> this is going to be a really bad answer, but the, each studio has their own definition of what makes uh, a block out, and they will define that for you. But what we try to do is, in most block outs that we've shown, is that you'll have these gridded materials similar that you saw in my backgrounds of my slide. That helps us keep in form of the metrics, which is really important. And stuff like lighting, some places will ask you to do a basic lighting pass. Now, we're not lighting artists. There are incredible developers who master that craft. But we go through and we add the basic lights of this is the main entrance. These are maybe side entrances by just placing just a simple static light over there. Other times, we'll use color coding boxes. So main paths, you might have yellow around the door frame. Side paths might be green. It depends. So sadly, there isn't like a universal answer. It'll depend per studio. But there are definitely different ways. And your leads and seniors should hopefully give you that definition before you work. But if it is just you working on a personal project, I would advise keeping these gridded materials for your portfolio. Because again, it's helping you show the metrics, which is super important. And then I would use color blocks or just a basic light above that. That's how I would define it anyway, me personally. So I hope that answers that question, Mike. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Uh, hi. I'm hey. a student at the uh, Two Shoes. Uh, Pleasure to meet you, sir. How would you make open fields or, uh, I mean, open areas right. interesting? Uh, so <laughs> I've mainly worked in cities through my experience, but it's a great question. I mean, the Uncharted and God of War series do this so well. I think it comes from a few things. When we talk about portfolios, just in that example there, you'll see a lot of students' work will be very flat. But if you know around, especially where we are, right, like there's so much mountains and so much verticality, use that in the space. Whether that's just one meter or 20 centimeters, break the space up. Another way you can do that is by breaking up the line of sight. So, you know, I can see nearly everyone up at the back. Can you give me a wave at the back? So I can see all of their beautiful faces and they can see mine. But maybe if we wanted to encourage exploration, we'd have a pillar in front of their faces. I'm sorry, you're still all beautiful, but we'll just do it for this example. We'll place it there. So I might want to be interested or they might be interested to walk around to the side versus straight forward from that. So that's another way to break it up. I think also by having great artists and atmosphere, you can use that. But I think the most important thing is use height, use, gather those references to see what nature offers here that might be, or where we base the game, right? So we can use those to be points of interest to pull the player in. And we talked about the flow, controlling the flow, right? It's understanding when we put enemies in there, what spaces can use that versus of when we want to deliver some form of narrative, right? So those are different ways. Height, breaking up line of sight, as well as points of interest. There's many more out there, but those are kind of my three. We'll put with this answer here, Chow. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, mate. Uh, hi. Uh, hey, great mate. great uh, talk. Thank you. So uh, I was wondering uh, specifically if uh, 
if audio has if you ever used audio uh, in the mm -hmm. blockout process to kind of define the atmosphere and and the space yeah so some places i have others i haven't because it depends where you are on the project right if we when we're starting a new ip for example the audio team are still actually working on defining those kind of examples but when like it's a dlc or expansion we'll speak with audio now and now we'll ask say if i'm making a factory there might be already mechanical sounds so we'll use them place a simple like audio volume for that section but it's very basics right like we're using simple like audio volume per section. So it's not gonna be the best final cue this sound at that point, but something to help us. So sometimes we do, sometimes not, but like including audio, even in those kickoff meetings, I recommend for everyone. Cause again, as soon as they know what they're making, the more incredible people we have pitching on great ideas, the better we can iterate and make something better. So sometimes, sadly, I feel like this is gonna be the answers for most of these questions. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but yeah, yeah. I hope that answers Thanks. it. No worries, champ. Hey, mate. Hey. Um, I saw you used Cyberpunk 2077 mm -hmm. in your presentation. Yes. And I've been playing that recently. Uh -huh. And one of my one thing that caught my eye is how different it is, like the different areas, like between yeah. the inner city and, say, Pacifica. Yep. <clears throat> well. What was the reason behind, for example, making it so distinctive difference between yeah. Pacifica <clears throat> compared to where, for example, the afterlife is placed? Yeah. So great <clears throat> question, man. This, uh, and I'm excited that I could talk about this. Uh, so we had, we were fortunate enough to have what we call like urban designers in the project. One of them called Jay, who is phenomenal uh, at what she does. And we wanted to show how especially in the cyberpunk 2077 universe, how the wealthy had kind of separated, right? It's very clear who has money and who doesn't. And we also wanted to show that across. So that's why we had certain spaces having different influence as well. And we also found that different types of people in terms of minorities obviously were affected around the world, right? It's not just happening in Night City, but the actual world. So when people immigrated together in different groups, they start to add their own kind of take, whether that be architecture or graffiti to that world as well. So we really wanted to show, again, the difference in the power for the narrative, but also show, again, how each kind of culture influences different spaces. And it's great for us as level designers because it teaches us different kind of techniques for different spaces as well, mate. So that's why there. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, mate. Hello. Hey. Um, so what are the greatest challenges when finding the balance between the game looking good and having it run smoothly for the players? <laughs> so you'll hear a lot between game art and, uh, and, and level design go back and forth about uh, what each space should be. But the, the challenge comes from understanding the level, I think. We talked about, again, controlling the flow of the mission. It's understanding, again, making sure you know who's on your team, but communicating which area should be heavy gameplay, so which areas we need to control more of a flow of, versus that of spaces where we might be delivering narrative, or maybe this here is a transition space, so we make sure that the artist has free reign and has more control there. I think it comes about talking to your team and establishing what each space has purpose of, and then also making sure that you go through. And, you know, it's a collaborative process, it's not, you know, as much as I'd love to say, hey, hey level design is the most important thing ever, it's not true. But again, establish that, communicate, and then you'll find the best way to work is that. So constant communication is the answer. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much for the questions. As I said, I really appreciate you all being here for my talk. Enjoy the rest of this. If we could have a round of applause for everyone who's actually set up, put together this event, that would be great as well. So thank you to everyone. <laughs>